Hello all, welcome back to ATM5, Our Changing Atmosphere. In today's lecture, we'll be continuing our discussion of extreme weather and how it is affected under climate change. Today, we'll be focusing on extreme precipitation and two types of extreme storms that bring that precipitation, supercells and tropical cyclones. In this lecture, we'll be defining supercell and tropical cyclone. We'll also be asking, how is extreme precipitation and flooding changing? How are supercells and tornadoes changing because of climate change? And how are tropical cyclones changing because of climate change? From earlier discussions, we already know that warmer air will tend to hold more water vapor. For dry regions of the world, this can make it more difficult to reach 100% relative humidity and trigger condensation, so leading to these dry regions becoming drier. For wet regions of the world, a ready source of moisture ensures that relative humidity is kept relatively constant. Under warmer temperatures, this means that there will be more water vapor in the air. When that air is lifted, the water vapor is squeezed out, producing precipitation episodes. The more water vapor in the air, the more there is to be squeezed out, and so the greater potential for extreme precipitation. It is thus no surprise that observed trends in extreme precipitation events in the U.S., as shown in the left plot here, are strongly correlated with the observed global trend in temperatures on the right. Observed declines in extreme precipitation during the relatively cool period of the 1910s to 1930s, a peak in the 1940s in line with warming in that decade, and then subsequent rises commensurate with increasing temperatures. It is further expected that those regions where we have seen the greatest increase in flooding events are those that have experienced the greatest increases in precipitation. In the left plot, we see increases in precipitation throughout the Great Plains, in the Midwest, in Northern California, and the U.S. Northeast. Simultaneously, we see drying in the U.S. Southwest, through the Rockies, and in the Southeast. In the right plot, we see observed changes in flood magnitude by region. In general, the observed changes in these watersheds match with the plot on the left. Over the coming century, precipitation projections using climate modeling systems also suggest significant moistening in the north and drying to the south, particularly in winter and spring. This suggests further risk of flooding, particularly in the northern Great Plains, Midwest, and U.S. Northeast. Most climate model projections uh, project drying in the summer season across the U.S. Under future projections, the U.S. Southwest will dry in winter through summer, with particular implications for flow down the Colorado River and all the states that draw that water. The 2019 Arkansas River flood event, one of the billion dollar disasters of 2019, is perhaps exemplary of what we will expect in the coming century for the Great Plains. The 12 months prior to May 2019 were the wettest in 124 years of records, and this event was assessed as a once in, 100, in 200 year flood event. The event itself is attributed to increased atmospheric moisture and contains the fingerprints of climate change. Into the future, extreme precipitation events such as these are expected to become more common, with corresponding risks to communities and infrastructure. Staying with the topic of the Great Plains, let's turn our attention to the effect climate change will be having on supercell storms and tornadoes. By definition, a supercell is a meteorological system producing severe thunderstorms and featuring rotating winds sustained by a prolonged updraft. These are some of the most extreme storms in the world, although they are typically only tens of kilometers across. Supercells are known for spawning tornadoes whose extreme winds can have devastating impacts on everything they touch. The response of supercells and tornadoes to climate change is highly uncertain, but we have a fairly good grasp of how their upstream drivers may change. For instance, we already know that there will be more water vapor in the atmosphere, and so thunderstorms and supercells will release more energy during condensation, leading generally to more energetic storms. But that is not the only driver of these systems. What distinguishes supercells from common convective systems is the presence of two distinct downdrafts and a rotating mesocyclone. The rotating mesocyclone here is key, as its strong rotation is a necessary precursor for tornado formation. The detection of a mesocyclone is the necessary condition for a tornado warning. The downdrafts in the supercell are so named because of where they are in the storm. The supercell possesses both a forward flank downdraft and a rear flank downdraft. The forward flank downdraft is responsible for generating the gust front, which is a region of strong winds at the front of the storm. These systems are strong enough that they can reach through the whole extent of the troposphere, producing an anvil cloud around the tropopause analogous to other deep convective clouds. These systems typically move from southwest to northeast and are around 40 kilometers long. Other features of these systems are visible in the figure on the right-hand side here. 
Supercells begin in much the same way as thunderstorms. They require moisture, unstable air, and some lifting mechanism to be kicked off. In addition, supercells also require vertical wind shear, that is, a change in the intensity of horizontal wind speeds at higher altitudes, with weaker winds at the surface and stronger winds aloft. The presence of the vertical wind shear leads to the updraft and downdraft being in different locations, and produces a twisting effect that is responsible for the formation of the mesocyclone. From the supercell, tornado formation occurs as follows. First, the presence of vertical wind shear leads to the production of a mesocyclone, or a region of rotating air around a horizontal axis. Second, the updrift, updraft tilts the mesocyclone upward, so that it is angled with respect to the storm. Third, the updraft begins rotating with the spinning column of air. If the mesocyclone touches the ground and is sufficiently compact, it can then be responsible for the formation of a tornado. For more information, the YouTube video linked here provides a brief summary of the formation of such a supercell. So with these ingredients in mind, how do we anticipate climate change will be affecting the formation of supercells? Climate change is already expected to make the atmosphere more moist and potentially more unstable because of surface heating. So this is a factor that has the potential to drive more intense storm systems. But supercells are not only driven by increased atmospheric moisture. They also need vertical wind shear to produce the mesocyclone that differentiates them from regular thunderstorms. This is covered in more advanced atmospheric dynamics classes, but vertical wind shear actually tends to be closely related to horizontal gradients in temperature. That is, strong horizontal gradients in temperature give rise to stronger wind shear and a more rapid increase in wind magnitude with altitude. This is actually closely related to why equator to pole temperature gradients are responsible for producing features like the jet streams. So if wind shear is driven by horizontal pressure gradients, how do we expect those to change in the future? Well, we already know from the IPCC assessment report projections that temperatures are expected to increase more rapidly in polar regions than they are near the equator. This is in large part because of ice albedo feedback. That is, melting ice, particularly sea ice, greatly reduces the local albedo and causes a greater fraction of incident radiation to be absorbed in the Arctic. This feedback process is also known as polar amplification. Consequently, the temperature differential between the mid-latitudes and the poles will be reduced, which in turn produces weaker shear and weaker jet streams. Thus, our best projections suggest weaker upper-level air speeds under climate change. In summary, we expect storms to generally become more intense because of more water vapor in the air. This contributes to both the amount of condensation and the amount of energy available to the storm. We also expect wind shear to decrease at large scales in response to weakening temperature gradients, which is unfavorable to the development of supercells and ultimately the development of tornadoes. There is some difficulty in ascertaining the historical trend in tornado count in order to back up this theory, because tornadoes generally need to be observed and many tornadoes touch down in regions with sufficiently low population density that they are not actually recorded in the historical record, particularly tornadoes that occurred up to 50 years ago. Nonetheless, from NOAA, our best records to date suggest little trend in the number of US tornadoes of category EF1 or higher, and a slight decline in the most intense tornadoes, that is, the category of strong to violent tornadoes, or EF3 or higher. Okay. That's our brief introduction to supercells and tornadoes under climate change. There's still a lot to be learned on this subject and a lot of gaps in our existing knowledge, but I expect it's a problem we'll better understand in the coming decade. Let's now turn our attention towards another big storm system that is one of the first things most people think about when they hear extreme weather, namely tropical cyclones. I use the term tropical cyclone here, but in the US, these features are more commonly referred to as hurricanes. The term cyclone more generally refers to a circulation around a low-pressure center. Some common meteorological systems that are considered cyclones are extratropical cyclones, tropical cyclones, and tornadoes. However, the range of scales of these features is immense. Extratropical cyclones are typically more than 1,000 kilometers across, tropical cyclones more around 600 kilometers, and tornadoes only a few hundred meters. Formally, a tropical cyclone is a rapidly rotating storm system characterized by a low-pressure center, a well-defined eye, strong winds, and a spiral arrangement of thunderstorms. A satellite image of one such tropical cyclone is shown here on the right. Tropical cyclones are intense centers of low pressure that form over tropical and subtropical oceans. 
Tropical cyclones form in these regions because they require warm sea surface temperatures to provide sufficient energy to drive strong convection. The intense convective activity and rotary circulation of these storms can drive wind speeds in excess of 74 miles per hour. Tropical cyclones have a range of scales but are generally between 100 and 1500 kilometers in diameter, with the average being around 600 kilometers, and they form between 5 degrees and 20 degrees latitude in both hemispheres. As cyclonic systems, they have a steep pressure gradient around a deep low pressure region in the center. A well-defined and closed-in eye is a necessary characteristic of these systems. Tropical cyclones have different names depending on which ocean, ocean basin they're found in. In the Atlantic and Northeast Pacific, they're called hurricanes. In the Northwest Pacific, they're called typhoons. And in the Southwest Pacific and Indian Ocean, they are simply called cyclones. At the heart of the tropical cyclone is its eye, which features the lowest pressure of the storm. Because of geostrophic balance, winds rotate counterclockwise around the low in the northern hemisphere and clockwise around the low in the southern hemisphere. Within the eye, descending air from above gives rise to calm winds and clear skies. Around the periphery of the eye is the eye wall, which features strong winds and a strong rotating updraft that carries moisture from the surface to the top of the storm. Going farther out from the eye wall, we observe alternating bands of warm air and cold sinking air. The regions of warm rising air are referred to as the rain bands of the storm, as they're the source of much of the storm's precipitation. The lower plot shows a typical surface air pressure on top of the surface wind speed on the bottom. Surface pressure is minimum at the center of the storm, whereas surface wind speed is maximum in the eye wall, decaying towards the periphery of the storm. Tropical cyclones can be found in most ocean basins, with the most cyclones found in the northwestern Pacific and northeastern Pacific. It's also common to find storms in the Atlantic, Indian Ocean, and Southwest Pacific. Practically no storms can be found in the Southeast Pacific or South Atlantic, where sea surface temperatures are relatively cooler than the other ocean basins. Tropical cyclones are powered by these warm ocean temperatures and so dissipate quickly once they find themselves over land. California has only been the target of one or two storms in the past hundred years, mostly remnants of eastern Pacific storms. In general, the Pacific waters off the California coast are too cold to support tropical cyclones. In the northern hemisphere, most tropical cyclones form close to the equator and track northwest before turning northeast. In the southern hemisphere, they track southwest before turning southeast. Tropical cyclones are pushed around by the steering flow, which is largely determined by the general circulation. Near the equator, the trade winds push air to the west. In the mid-latitudes, the dominant circulation is from west to east. The formation of tropical cyclones requires both warm ocean waters to provide energy to the storm and spin to drive rotation of the storm. Since Coriolis force is zero or nearly zero in the vicinity of the equator, tropical cyclones cannot exist here. The top map shows global sea surface temperatures, with deep orange and red colors corresponding to regions warm enough to support tropical cyclone genesis. The bottom map shows typical genesis locations of these storms and the corresponding storm season for these basins. In the Atlantic, most storms form off the coast of Africa and are carried across the Atlantic by the steering flow. One of the biggest impacts from tropical cyclones comes from storm surge, a coastal flood or tsunami-like phenomenon. Storm surge commonly occurs because of low pressure weather systems such as cyclones. Storm surge is a combination of both high speed winds directing ocean waters onshore and a pressure surge in the eye of the storm because of the low surface pressure sucking water upward. The magnitude of the storm surge is not necessarily connected with the land falling strength of the cyclone, but is a product of local conditions as well as sea level. In the future, under sea level rise, we anticipate storm surge to become increasingly burdensome for local communities, particularly in the path of these tropical cyclones. So how might tropical cyclones be affected by climate change? Most relevant to this question, we know that tropical cyclones require warm sea surface temperatures to facilitate formation and prohibit decay. Tropical cyclones are also fueled by the release of latent heat when water vapor condenses. And precipitation in tropical cyclones is affected by increases in atmospheric water vapor as well. In the future, we know that both the sea surface and air temperatures are warming, ultimately impacting these tropical cyclones. Science to date has largely drawn six key conclusions related to tropical cyclones under climate change. First, we know tropical cyclones will become more intense due to increasing latent heat release. Second, we know tropical cyclones will precipitate more, around 7% per degree of warming. 
Third, we expect storms to last longer since warmer sea surface temperatures will delay the decay of tropical cyclones as they reach higher latitudes. Fourth, sea level rise accompanying warming will lead to greater storm surge and more flooding. Fifth, model, model simulations generally show an increase in the most intense hurricanes, specifically category four and five storms, but a decrease in the total number. This decrease in total number is likely related to more intense storms causing strong mixing of the ocean surface, which can bring up colder waters from depth and thus delay following tropical storms. Finally, we know that the exact change in each of these quantities depends on the particular ocean basin. This map shows expected changes in tropical cyclone characteristics under two degrees of global warming. The plot shows differences in tropical cyclone frequency, frequency of the most intense storms, storm intensity, and storm rain rate. Generally, tropical cyclone frequency is likely to decrease, although individual storms are expected to become more intense and produce much more precipitation. The result is more widespread flooding related to landfalling storms. All right, that's all for today. There's still a lot of exciting research going on related to the impact of climate change on precipitation and storms, and many gaps that remain in our current knowledge. That about wraps up everything in this course on physical changes in the climate system. Next time, we'll be talking about climate change adaptation and mitigation.